So today we're talking with Sky Wallace, who's a Toronto-based artist. And uh, I don't think, are you originally from Toronto? Because I don't get a Toronto vibe from you. I'm kind of from all over. I moved around a lot when I was young. So uh, I think like the place that I gravitated to the most as far as like the moves were was uh, kind of east of Toronto in Durham region. Uh, Because that's where my grandparents were. So I uh, I'd say like that's the closest thing to a hometown I have, but yeah, from all over, like all over Ontario, BC, I've got family kind of dispersed around the country. So yeah. You were, on, you were born in Ontario though? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I really enjoyed your set uh, in Montreal at uh, Pitsy Campus. Thank and you. I honestly, I apologize. I'd never heard of you before. No, yeah, that's cool. And that's... you have like about what, three albums out? Yeah, I think it's technically more because there was one that is, it, it was just like a very different vibe than what I've been doing kind of with this, like this iteration of the project. Uh, so it was more, I used to do like more of a, like a folk thing. Uh, so I did do some other recordings under that kind of, uh, that, that guise. But uh, yeah, the last three albums have been kind of gearing more towards what it is now, which is like the rock and roll thing that I've been after. So I'm stoked. It's funny because a lot of people, I, a lot of artists I speak with, when we, we try to, they try to be categorized, you know, and I, I, there's so many artists that you can't really put in a specific category. Do you know what totally. I mean? Totally. Absolutely. And, and I think that there's beauty in that too. Like that, like fluidity within all the genre. That's like how new things happen, I think. Well, I, I don't know too many people that only listen to one style of music. I mean right yeah that's so true and like i know because i'll be oh here here's a, a funny funny fact so I, I i tried to research you a little bit before speaking to you just to have some kind of idea and there's a sky wallace in brisbane in australia who's uh who killed a cop with a stolen car and there was a manhunt out for her so wow damn that's not you right no nope. <laughs> <laughs> just joking Get to know. <laughs> I just I type in Sky Wallace news, and the first thing that popped up was this woman, this fugitive who killed a cop with a stolen car. Damn, wild! I was like, I was like wow, she's really more punk rock than I thought yeah. she was. <laughs> no kidding, that's hilarious. Cool. So you started off kind of you said folksy, right? Like yeah. Of- yeah, I think that still informs kind of like my songwriting, like especially with with the last record that we put out in 2019, uh, that was my self-titled record. Um, it was kind of like, it was a rock sound, but the storytelling through line was kind of where I went with the lyricism and like the songwriting. Uh, mm-hmm. I w- did two residencies in, uh, one was Western Newfoundland and one was in the Yukon. And I wrote kind of like all, each of the songs were in sto- inspired by a story of people that I'd read about, people that I'd met, uh, just like stories of place of where I was. Mm. Uh, and it was kind of that, like what is typically, I think like a storytelling songwriting tool for more folk music. It was kind of cool to blend that take into, into kind of a rock sphere. So that was a really fun project to do. I mean, I don't, why do they consider folk music to be, I mean, only folk music as storytelling? Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, typically what people would say is like the the thing to do the storytelling element I guess maybe because of like things like ballads and more literal storytelling Mm -hmm. takes instead of like a more poetic kind of thing but uh, I mean I think it's it's strewn throughout I think songs are stories well I guess also I mean back like in the 60s or whatnot when you know protest songs came out and that was like the Joni Mitchells and the Buffy St. Marie's. And there was a lot of really cool women folk singers who actually changed their style along the way. I don't know if you're a fan of Joni or Buffy or or not. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. You have to read the Joni Mitchell biography. Oh yeah. I haven't yet actually. I don't have, I had it and I lend it out. Okay. Uh, It's called Reckless Daughter. Amazing. Okay. It's really good. I'll check it out. And I just finished, I love, I love reading biographies and then read this one. It's still this, have you read this one? I've been meaning to, I really want to. Yes. That's on my like list for 2022. Do you know that? Okay. Sorry. Now I'm like a history teacher. Do you know that they put on a stamp? She's on a stamp now. 
They oh, have a Buffy. Oh, yeah. Do you know how fucking cool Buffy St. Marie is? Oh, I mean, she's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, so like, cool. nobody knows. I'm, I'm so, like, why isn't, why aren't people talking about her more? I mean, I, I love her. I know a lot of people who love her. She's really? like a legend. Yeah, and absolutely. She started off as a folk singer, but she's yep. got a lot of songs that are almost punk. Yeah, you know? totally. There's lots of like kind of shifting in, in her music. It's like, it takes on a lot of different pieces. And yeah, no, it's super cool. Just like the arc of like how she's as an artist has like yeah. made her mark. It's really cool. Yeah. I'm like, I was obsessed with her. And then I read her biography and I was like, I even fell more in love with her on many levels. And, and also like coming back to your songs, like, like I'm going to go into swing batter. Cause that was the one that really struck, struck me the most, pardon the pun. A lot of your songs are very, I don't want to say political, but you're, you're telling some heavy stories mm -hmm. and you're, you're pissed off. And I, that's what I really like about you is that you're dealing with heavy subjects, but you're really making your point that come across really clear, loud and clear. Yeah, I think, I think that's kind of like my, my MO with, with making and, and performing music is that like, uh, especially with this, the rock and roll kind of frequency, mm. like you get uh, an opportunity to connect with people in a really visceral, uh, like vulnerable kind of way, because people yeah. let loose, they like really uh, just kind of like let down their inhibitions uh, when it comes to rock music. There's this connective energy that is is possible. And so it's like, it's a great opportunity to like talk about life and all of the like nitty gritty, all of the like the fucked up shit, all of the like the tough stuff, all of the like, I don't know, little ugly pieces of being human, but all the like beautiful things. It's like all encompassing uh this like celebration of of being human and I think there's like that's it's a great vehicle for change for that reason because you get to like I don't know just uh say it out loud and dissect it in a room full of people that wouldn't necessarily uh get to talk to each other at a coffee shop one-on-one -on -one, you know it's just like all everybody coming together I think that's really special so that's for me is like why I write things uh, and like why I want to write about the things that I do because it's uh yeah it feels feels important well it's obviously it's a great release but it's so cathartic and and you'd be surprised like a lot of pe people i'm sure relate to the stuff you're talking about yeah and there's subjects that many people don't want to talk about maybe mm -hmm. or or difficult to talk about how's your what's your process like do the lyrics come first do the melodies come first kind of comes together where like like the melody and like the the syntax definitely is there but I have like pieces of lyrics that I want to incorporate so like I will yeah it kind of comes in with more of like the feeling where it's like I want to evoke this feeling that I'm feeling in myself right now um so I think like musically then that can kind of like that informs the music that informs like the syntax of like how I want to like be uh phrasing the lyrics but then also like I'll have little fragments that can come together and kind of work work together that's kind of my typical process well yeah I mean you've been sort of labeled a bit punk and a bit folk right so mm -hmm. the the folk folk part is like you're telling a story very gently and you have a very calm and soothing voice so you're you're drawing people in and they're really listening to the story right mm -hmm. whereas the the punk aspect or let's say when you're using more electric guitars instead of acoustic you're more like in your face you're pissed off you're angry you're more you know yeah or just more of like that that punk rock ethos too where like it's you know that that it's a rock and roll thing too where it's like especially with the live show uh lots of little like not everything's like exactly perfect it's like raw and there's like the energy and like the the kind of like the fire is guiding everything and that's what I don't know I, that's what I really like about the performative aspect or like the I rather the the performance aspect what were like the first like let's say punk kind of bands that you you listened to or my favorite band when I was like quite young was against me and so like that especially that um because at the time when I was listening to them they had a bit more of like the uh like acoustic 
punk okay. thing, uh, some of their earlier records. And uh, I was just like, what is this? Uh, and so that through that, I kind of like opened my world to like lots of other punk bands. Uh, but that has been actually through through everything. Like Laura Jane Grace is like my one of my huge heroes. So just like over the entire, like the course of their entire discography against me has been like my band for sure. Okay. Yeah. Did you, like growing up, like did your parents listen to rock or folk or? Yeah, like definitely rock. Like my dad was into Rush and uh, Tragically Hip and like uh, lots of like classic rock, like Led Zeppelin and that kind of stuff, which was awesome. Um, Is and that, then my mom. That what you, you call, yeah, what's, what's dad rock or something? Oh, uh, just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, I don't know, like the dad rock, that like, like kind of like tragically hip, like things that you'd listen to on like a cottage rock station kind of thing. Okay. I think it's very important. Actually, the tragically hip for me have been like a huge through line because like they were this like rock band that connected with all of, especially like men in like my dad's generation in Ontario, especially like just that's, that's my specific uh, experience with them. And like, I'm a huge fan of theirs. But they did this thing where it was like this rock and roll kind of like good times feel with this poetry and like realness in the lyrics. And then also just like the stances that they took, like, you know, these, especially around like my dad's generation, they feel comfortable or like they weren't allowed to feel in public. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they were like at these shows, like crying, like holding their best friends and like seeing, uh, you know, Gord and the rest of the band, like two men kiss on stage and that was great and celebrated just like things like that I felt like it was just like I don't know there's something so uh transformative about that that like I love and want to like take forward with my stuff for sure like it's yeah feels magical have you have you seen the tragically hit perform live I saw the last tour oh, wow. one show and it was very emotional um yeah it was amazing Actually, here's an odd question. I don't know. I, I mean, people still do kind of listen to the radio, even though mm -hmm. there's, I haven't, do they play you on the radio? Do they play you on CBC? Like who plays your stuff? Uh, CBC has been very supportive. Uh, Sirius XM has been very supportive, especially with The Verge. Um, and then like in town, like Indy 88, uh, lots of radio stations around Ontario, even outside of Ontario. Uh, Chom actually has been really lovely uh, and I did like some features when the record was coming out and Jason Rockman did the, uh, yeah, did I the saw that. intro the other night which is really nice um, yeah no it's been great I haven't like ventured into radio very much before the last record just because it was like I was doing more like alternative stuff that didn't quite fit on radio but with this stuff we wanted to do that as a team and had like a bunch of really awesome folks support us along the way so it's like mm -hmm. a cool thing to see kind of building does radio really even matter anymore for artists like first of all like uh getting people uh just like getting new fans like I have a lot of folks who have come to shows and who have like you know supported or just listened to music my music otherwise that heard it just by way of radio which is great and just like like accessing people, especially in territories where you're not like you're not from or you don't get to tour to as often. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also just like it, it is like the royalties from radio are, are awesome. So like it does support artists in a way that like the streaming services don't monetarily. Mm -hmm. So it is. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because, yeah, who knows about like the, the future of radio? It's like a weird, a weird time, but uh, it, it has lots of supportive elements for artists for sure yeah I grew up with radio and and vinyl that's how mm -hmm. that's what I grew up with and now it's streaming you know and mm -hmm. I know artists don't make money from streaming it's it's really sad but yeah it's it's but, also like I, I see it as a way of like it it gets your music out there to folks who wouldn't necessarily come across it otherwise so I think there's like there's merit to it I'm not like I'm not super uh bummed about streaming even though like it's good that we like we need to continue having these conversations about like whether or not it supports artists because like yeah sometimes it isn't like financially viable to have a, a career in music and that's adding to it but yeah it's it's complicated <laughs> well people are making more money off of youtube like on people just like youtube channels now like i see all these youtube youtubers 
that not, aren't necessarily talented or skilled, but have followers and they're making money somehow mm -hmm. because that's where we're at. Yep. I mean, it's kind of cool. Like, and things like TikTok and things like that as well. Like it's kind of, it's kind of cool that it has now everybody is able to access like the access point of mm -hmm. creating content and like making art and like what art means is like, it's kind of cool to see this transformation. Uh, just like, you know, lots of, you know, there's there, with, with TikTok specifically, you can have like, you could have like 50 followers and then make a post that goes viral because of the algorithm. And then suddenly millions of people are seeing one post. Like it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of broken down the algorithm in a really cool way. Uh, and has kind of leveled the playing field as far as like content creation. Um, yeah, no, it's it's interesting. I know uh, myself as well as like a lot of artists and a lot of people have had very like love hate relationships with social media. And I think mm -hmm. like personally, I'm at a point where I'm I'm feeling very good about it. Like it's you okay. can see it as like a fun creative thing and a way to connect yeah. with people and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's it's good to be mindful, of just like mental health and how much time you spend on social media but for me I think I'm I think I'm in a good place with it it's good to connect with people even when you're not in the same room like it's cool especially with everything that's happened in the last two years <laughs> so at the show uh where I saw you recently so here's the thing that struck me with you that's why I was like I got to talk to this lady this girl this young lady I was like your some of your songs deal with like really dark and heavy mm -hmm. like subject matter and you're really angry and pissed off which I really mm -hmm. I like that but I noticed and I felt it because it wasn't a very big venue is that you seemed so freaking happy to be. I could tell like when I called you a candle, you were like, because that, that this is kind thank of you for that, by the way. That was lovely. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. But anyway, Love it. I could tell I'm not I know I'm not the only one you were you look like you were so happy to be there. I mean, first of all, I, I absolutely was. I feel like uh, the the last like year or two has made me realize that like performing is you know not the only part of me but it's a part that makes me whole uh, yeah. and so getting back to it again was just like unbelievable mm -hmm. uh, like seconds like playing with Cranlands was incredible they're just like so inspiring and awesome also like Pussy Campus I wanted to play there for a long time just because when I was you know when I was uh, starting to discover music in Canada when I was like a teenager like all of my favorite bands would I would hear going through pretty campus oh, okay. and I was like oh this is like I would love to play there someday so this was like a it was a very good momentous okay. occasion for me and then also like my bandmates are we're like this family and it just it feels so so good every time and it's like I know that's like a that maybe comes off as like a bit of a cliche because people are like oh like we're a band family but like it does I do feel like each of these people are like my like soulmates like they're we're just like we like to hang out when we're not playing music and when we do it just feels like I don't know like there's just joy in all of our chests and uh we feed off of each other and even if like something goes wrong that's okay like it it just fuels um the joy that we feel because like that's the other thing that I want to do with music is to like like to connect with people and to like pass joy along to like help people like feel things but feel good things too uh especially so like yeah I think that's I, I'm very lucky to have found the people that I play with. Uh, yeah. How did you like? How long have you been with the, with your musicians, and how how did you guys all get together? Um, so I had I had a very like revolving door band for a while, just because I was like I was touring a lot. I would be like kind of between like going back and forth between Vancouver and Toronto for a while. So I had like different oh. bands in different areas, um, uh, and more recently, I guess like this configuration has been like the five of us for about three years uh and I kind of like found them through different means like the drummer I found through like a recommendation from a friend my friend Alfie who's the drummer uh Jay the bassist I found through a recommendation from Devin who's the guitar player and he was like producing stuff for me uh and then joined the band afterward and Gina uh who's the amazing keyboard player uh just kind of joined us when I it was like the time to add keys and vocals and something mm. else to the thing. And she was the only person I could think of. She's uh, magical. So <laughs> it was just like, it worked out in this uh, meandering kind of way, but I'm so glad I found them. I, I often ask musicians and their bands like about the chemistry and what, what, what's the formula for a good band, you know? 
Mm -hmm. I've asked a lot of people that. And I mean, you know, there's famous rock relationships, you know, you've got Jagger and Richards and you've got, you know, what big personalities that clash often, yeah. let's say, you know, another band I had interviewed said it's, it is, what's the word? It is chemistry and it's luck, but it's also like, you're all on the same page. You all want the same thing. Yeah. You all, you're all like vibing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And in that same way, like communication is really important mm -hmm. and like, you know, talent, of course, super important for everybody to be like good at their craft but it's also like important to respect each other and to like yeah. understand what each other needs and like to be there uh not just kind of like for your own needs which we like you know as humans we all are at certain points but like yeah. it's just nice to be in a situation where there's just like a lot of back and forth and like support uh and love yeah yeah so i think like it's it's a, it's you know it took took a long time to get there a lot of like life experience in order to like mm -hmm. figure out what I need and how I need to be to other people but I think like this has been a really good uh, example of just like what I would always want uh, and what I hope to always have with these folks so well it, it's your name on on the bill like I mean mm -hmm. it's your band right so mm -hmm. kind of you're the boss aren't you yeah I like call the shots uh, as far as like. I guess like any admin stuff or like planning that kind of thing mm -hmm. um but like yeah no it's a great situation where like the live show has been like our our little baby so whenever we can do that i'm very stoked so are you i'd like to actually see you guys again but are you coming back to montreal at any point we will be. I'm not sure exactly when, but we do have a new record uh, coming out next fall. There's going to be a new song coming out in January. So we're hoping to be like quite busy on the road uh, mm -hmm. for the next year. So I would assume and hope that Montreal is in that because I love coming to Montreal. And, uh, you know, I could see you guys at like Bar La Ritz. Have you ever been to La Ritz? Ooh, I've heard of it, but I haven't been. I would love that. Have you heard of I'd seen, I mean, I'm, I'm all over the place. Have you ever heard of the coat hangers? No. Oh, really? I'm going to write that down. They're like a punk slash, they're, they're so much fun. I saw them there. Yeah, it, there's not that many women punk kind of bands. Do you know what I'm saying? Totally, totally. Or I find if there are, sometimes they just, it, it's a lot, it's too stylized. Do you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I feel like that's a thing in something that I've come across in music, like just like the expectations that are put on, on non-men. Uh, it's like the, the brand thing. There's not a lot of space for the brand to be just yourself. Like I know a lot of uh, like male fronted bands where like their brand is like who they are. Like there's like, they can dress, in a way that's like you know there's like there's like a tailored thing to make it like consistent yeah. but their their personality is like who like who they are is enough you know mm. there's like a bit of an expectation for the brand of someone who's like a woman or gender non-conforming to be like a certain way or like well how can we package you in order for it to be digestible or for people to like give you a chance kind of thing which i hope will change and is shifting but like you know still lots of work to go for sure but that's something that I've experienced for sure I've had this I had a really like one of my favorite interviews during the pandemic was I don't know if you you know Sate oh, I love Sate such a fan our conversation was crazy and mm -hmm. I've never like spoke I mean I can't even I don't even know what to say yeah. but we went everywhere she's just yeah. brilliant and interesting and all kinds of stuff, so creative. Yeah. And we had this, we went, we started off like here and then we we just, we went everywhere. And conclusion was rock and roll was invented by a black woman. Absolutely. Sister is at a fart. Exactly. And she's, she's like punk rock and she, she's everything. I mean, she's yeah. like, I was, I was nervous before I interviewed her because I was like, oh my God, like I was like intimidated. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But she's she so kind and sweet. And mm -hmm. something that you said, just like 
rock and roll is at an interesting crossroads where like you keep hearing like oh rock and roll is dead or whatever like it's it's shifting mm-hmm. from rock and roll but i do think it's like especially exciting right now because it's led by like black folks indigenous folks people of color women like gender non-conforming folks non-binary folks trans folks like it's all of these people who haven't been allowed in these spaces or haven't felt welcome in these spaces yes. who are making music that like it's just so refreshing and there's like a really cool kind of like rock and roll movement happening right now that I'm right. I remember back when women were in rock in this let's say 60s or 70s like mm-hmm. it was very limited you had like Janis Joplin yeah or you had Grace Slick from Jefferson Airplane right right and I mean you had to be pretty you had yeah. to sing you couldn't be too outspoken mm-hmm. right you couldn't be yeah. too much of a bitch you had to know your place and yeah. you were usually front you know you you were singing but the band was all male right yeah Mm -hmm. big time and then harp came along i remember when i was a kid i was obsessed with harp because i mean but they were also style i mean if you look at their album covers they're very stylized right yeah that whole gypsy witchy vibe the stevie nicks vibe right you said you you grew up you were listening to like against me but like were there any female artists that, you know, you saw as a, as a kid thinking like, wow, I want to be like her? Um, Patti Smith was one, actually. I just <laughs> love her. I love the poetry. I love that, like, she did, like, you know, she was like the, the poet laureate of punk rock. But, yes. like, the music wasn't, like, like in your face punk rock. It was this no. ethos thing, right? That, yes. that was, like, energy and rules to live by and, like, anti-authoritarian, uh, just, like, and, and like, there's punk rock in in the music being whatever it is that you want it to be like that's punk rock uh so I think like yeah she was a huge one for me where it was just like this is everything and it just like made so many things click and I think there's there's something cool about just like the punk rock ethos as well where it's like like because it can be any type of music like 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 Tanya Tagak for instance is yeah. like I think she is the most punk rock person out there right now you know like and it's just like it's it's about like the things that you say, the feelings that you exude, the like lack of uh, abiding by the constraints that you're that you're given. Yeah, like, it's the, the expectations. No, no fucks given attitude. Yeah, fuck yeah. yeah, and it's it's great. I love it. Love to see it. One of the artists that I always like was obsessed with that I find uh, doesn't get enough credit is Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders. Oh my god, yes, like, I love her read this where is it have you read this <laughs> i'm like a book club read this Ooh, okay sick i will she's really the, the real deal like yeah you know how many her bandmates like overdosed and died like within like yeah like wow she's had quite a life what's what's the last like let's say latest or most recent artist that you've listened to lately that really impressed you or like mm. And some really good ones. Um, I just started listening to this uh, person. They go by Talk, and they just played their first show in Toronto last week. Uh, and I just heard a couple songs on the radio, and it's just been like, like so good and like so refreshing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Talk, all capital letters, and they're based out of Toronto. Yeah, really good. Um, yeah, there's lots. I saw uh, this person that I've kind of uh like known just through through the internet for a while we have like the same agent so we've been on each other's radars for a while but I just saw him perform the other day uh he goes by Ace and Abby and it's a solo act and he's just like I don't know my jaw was on the floor for that one. Oh, he came he came on my news feed he's is he oh, really? indigenous is he native he is. Or, yeah? yeah he plays acoustic guitar yeah but it, like incredibly like does a lot of like tapping stuff his voice is like unbelievable like to die for uh yeah I'm really excited about where he's going yeah I heard about it did he open up for someone recently he opened up for Birds of Bellwoods the other day and then he's playing with Sam Roberts Sam I was supposed to go the Sam Roberts tour got canceled oh yeah and I was supposed yeah. to go and he's from Montreal so yeah we've we've played with them quite a bit um because we have the same agent as well uh and just like they have been so lovely to us like you know as an opening band they they were so supportive and I i'm did. just like so in awe of their live show like they're so tight so your um new music coming out january 
it's okay yeah yeah new record coming out next year I'm very excited about it's been like a long time of like uh just like the process of the record and like the getting it just so and the waiting and everything but it's like it's my first time putting something out with like a full team behind it and like it's very nice to have the support and uh yeah I'm I'm really excited so uh, will you are you doing it in studio or are you like working on it from different locations or um it's always finished uh but we over the course of like the last two years did it sometimes in studios depending like we we finished some stuff before the pandemic hit um so we did some of that stuff in studios we did uh like some remote stuff uh Mm -hmm. we did like uh sometimes like at one point i went into the studio and it was like it was like where there was like a dip uh, the numbers were like totally good, but there was still like that risk factor. So it was like, you know, masks on like super far apart. And then I'd go into the vocal booth and we'd like sequester or so things like that. So it was like lots of different creative ways uh, of doing things safely um, mm-hmm. and things I hadn't tried before, like the, the remote uh, recording and stuff like that. But it was good, honestly. Do you do you prefer singing or playing or both or does it? Um, I've had a really love hate relationship with playing guitar over the course of learning it. Like when I first picked it up, I was just using it as a tool to write. Uh, And the idea was like, okay, eventually I'll be able to like not have to play and I can just sing. But honestly, it's become like, I I would prefer to play and sing now. So uh, I think I do, I do love playing. It's like something that I'm like, I don't know, trying to like hone my craft and like, I want to get better at like lead playing and stuff like that over the next little while. Uh, But uh, yeah, I think in the studio, I am partial to singing because that's like my, I have a more of a background in singing and it's like, it's like my main, my lead instrument, if you will. Um, Like you studied, like, what did you study then? uh, I did like vocal training, I did like, uh, like Kiwanis festivals and things like that when I was younger. Uh, and, and I was with a vocal teacher for like eight years, Oh wow! Um, which was awesome. And it was like, you know, it started out in like a, a school as like an extracurricular thing, uh, oh. but then he left the school, uh, and he started his own practice and it was more of like an alternative, like we could kind of like choose the paths that we wanted to go down. So it included like, you know, sometimes musical theater, sometimes operettas, sometimes we'd bring in sheet music from like modern or like contemporary music at the time but it was like a really awesome just like lesson in like technique um that I think you know there was a long time where I rejected technique and I was like no that's not rock and roll uh which you know it isn't it isn't like I guess I just didn't want to sound like classical or like technically pretty so I like swung in the other direction but now it's kind of like I kind of landed in the middle where you know I don't sing like a classical singer would but I, the technique is there to like yeah. guide me through touring and to like keep things healthy or to be able to like sing big notes in a, in a healthy way. And I'm still, I'm just like, I'm still taking vocal coaching from, oh. from someone in Vancouver, which is, has been awesome just to like stay, uh, stay on top of it and sustainable and mm. healthy. So yeah, no, it was good. I'm, I'm grateful for the, for that time. Okay, so you didn't like take you take piano lessons or anything. You it was more okay. No, but, just vocals. <laughs> but, I mean, I could tell. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but you have that control. Like you mm. can sing really, really softly and very sweet, and then you could. You know what? My favorite one. I'll tell you my two favorite songs. Hold up. Oh yeah. Because I I haven't heard every single one of your songs. Yeah, no, that's cool. But one of my favorites. Here we go. Like songs. I like Dead Things Part Two. Ooh, cool. And Rumbling Soul. Like very very dramatic. (laughs) Thank you. Damn, those are throwbacks. I'm stoked that you like them. Like I said, I I haven't heard everything, everything, but I went through some. I mean, Swing Batter is like, wow. You know, that was the yeah. That's awesome. That shuts people up, doesn't it? oh man it is fun that's uh, that's funny that you brought up dead things part two that's like my my aunt who comes to all of my shows in toronto uh huge support uh my aunt jc that's her favorite song so it's -hmm. something that we like every once in a while we'll we'll creep back into the set even though like it it came out in 2014 i think but it's just like i love it i think it's such a fun song thanks to well you're saying fun but it's it's like 
Oh, it's not fun. Yeah, exactly. No, no. I know, but fun to me as like a writer, I guess. But yeah. yeah. So songs like that, they deal like they're very dark and heavy. So like, because I know Swing Batter is not based on a personal experience. It's mm -hmm. based on something you had read about, right? Yeah, yeah. But but songs like that that are really dark. I mean, do you just tap into your? You're really in touch with your with your dark side, or what do you want to call well, it? Well, I guess like this that particular song was written. I wrote it about like a like a story that I had kind of made up in my head, where there was this ghost. There was a person who died, and it's kind of from her perspective of like seeing somebody move on after after they've passed. Um, but also just like there's this aspect of haunting kind of being an addiction where it's like you can't like you don't want to like stay with the person and scare the person you want them to get on with your life their life because you love them but it's also this like thing that you can't stop coming back to and I think that's something that you know universally we experience when we when we like part ways with somebody in like a less uh, otherworldly metaphorical sense I think there's that aspect of like you know yeah things are done but like you keep wanting to be near them or whatever like just with like there's a know, cake, the process cake. the grieving process I guess there it reminded me of a Kate Bush song called watching you without me I don't know if you're oh, a Kate Bush fan I am I love her and some of your stuff kind of reminds me of Florence and the Machine as well cool thank you if, if you ever have a chance to see her in 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 concert I saw her once Oh. Um, I was at the Malkin Bowl in Vancouver, I think, and it was just like she had all these gowns, like these amazing outfits, and was just like there was wind blowing, and it was just like all of the pieces were just like it was just to show visually what the music was doing because it was just like this crazy, like yeah, magical thing. Yeah, the musician has this ability to create something to like capture and mesmerize people. Mm -hmm in a way that no other, let's say, profession or skill can do. It's, uh, it's like that quote, the, yeah, I guess the goal of the artist is to make revolution irresistible, right? It's that like shift in things, that like guiding force of like changing and uh, progress and like becoming a better world is shifted by way of the arts. And you have the two extremes Okay, so now, last book reference, but now I'm reading the Dave Grohl biography. <laughs> I started reading that, yeah. I'm a little I'm at the very, very beginning. How are you? <laughs> it's, it's here. What's it called? Storyteller. Right. My point about Dave, uh, about, we're back to the whole thing about musicians in general. You have the extremes, though. You have the artists that, they have the gift, Right. Mm -hmm. And they're able to have these beautiful lives and touch so many people and create so much. And then you've got, you know, like the Kurt Cobains and the Jim Morrisons. And I mean, the list goes on and on, you know, that, you know, that it's like a gift and a curse, right? Yeah. And there is a lot of, um, I don't know, I, I do see that like addiction is very prevalent in the music industry even now. Like it's, it's yeah. very much, oh, it's an alcohol fueled industry and like you know it's it's very it can be very grueling at times and like kind of drugs and alcohol are are adjacent to you yeah. constantly and so I think especially as like an artist that I'm sure all of these these people uh were very sensitive mm. um and it's and it's tricky even just like like myself like I I don't uh consider myself an addict but like I've I I have had issues where like alcohol can be like a crutch in a lot of social situations, especially because I am sensitive. I'm like, I can get quite socially anxious sometimes. And like, you're out, you're, you're, you're exhausted. You're like going to these networking events, you're playing shows, you're going to other people's shows to like co like to support other, other people in the scene. But like, it's, it's a lot. And I think, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting thing about like the, the last little while of just like taking a break from everything, mm. uh, forced to take a break from everything is that like, just that recognition of burnout yeah. um, and like self care and like acknowledging that like in order to do good work, you have to rest at some point. And yeah. I think it's just not built into our society. And that's where things like, you know, our dependencies keep us going where we maybe need to not keep going, need to stop. Yeah.
how do you recharge? Like, what do you do for your mental health or how do you? Well, I think, um, especially the last year, like this time last year, uh, like, I feel like my anxiety kind of like came to a bit of a head that I felt like I, like I had the space fortunately to deal with. Um, just like going to therapy, but I started like running for my, for just for my brain. That was amazing. Started meditating. Um, I think like drinking lots of water and like sleep, even though they're like, like, it's like, of course, but like that does wonders. Like if I don't get enough sleep, I just like need to after, especially after something like, like a tour, just getting as much sleep as I kind of need for a couple days, uh, really turns things around. Um, so yeah, those, that's kind of been my toolkit for the last little while. Uh, and that's been helping like a lot. So, and that, that aspect of, um, of social media now everybody is kind of like, a, like a, lives in a very public sphere. Mm. Um, and you feel like if you don't post all the time that everyone's going to forget about you, but like, it's that thing that like, you know, when you're like, I remember when I was like 12 years old and I was just starting to realize that like, you know, you're in public and people could look at you and judge you, uh, just like mm. perception and stuff. And I remember my mom being like, like, not to be mean at all. It was just like, you know, like everyone's more concerned with themselves than they are with you. And that's just like kind of the human condition is that like, not like, no, if you, you feel like everyone's staring at you, but really everyone's looking all over the place, looking at themselves, thinking about how everyone else is judging them. And like, you know, you know, there's some days where I'm like, I feel like I should post, but I don't want to. And it's like, nobody's going to notice if you don't. And if you feel like it's going to like take up your bandwidth or like your mental health state, like to take that time away is good. It's like important to remember that it's, uh, you know, it's not all on your shoulders all the time. Well, this was lovely. Thank you for the chat and for, for putting this together.